One of the most powerful lessons that you can ever learn. I had to learn as a young man. My own father was a man who uh, walked away. He left. He left home when I was just a baby. Left my mother, who's sitting right here, 107 years old. Is that what you know? You're not 107. 82 years old, though, and, and with three little boys. And all I had ever heard when he walked out about this person that my older brothers told me about and that uh, when my mother got her family back together again when I was nine years old and, and did all that she could to, uh, to make a family again, with all the hardships. This is a man who never made a phone call, who never sent a penny, who spent some time in prison, who was an alcoholic, who died of cirrhosis of the liver at the age of 49 and was buried in a pauper's grave in Biloxi, Mississippi. And it wasn't until I went to his grave and was able to stand there, and I used to dream about this man and have this enormous hatred for this person whom I had never seen, just based upon what he had done to my own mother and to my brothers and so on, and all of the stories that I had heard and all the research that I had done. And I ended up at his grave 10 years after he had died when I finally found out that he was dead. It was on the 27th of August, it was 1974. And what I did transformed my life. What I did is I believe I was sent there by God or whatever you want to call that divine spirit, that divine presence. And my life at that time wasn't working. I was overweight, my relationships weren't working, my writing wasn't working. There were a lot of things that weren't going well for me in my life at that time. Not badly, but they weren't going at the level that I knew I was capable of getting to because I was filled with this hatred, this anger, this bitterness. And so what I did is I stood there on his grave on this little marker in the ground and I said, from now on I send you love. I forgive you. Mark Twain said that forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And once I let go of that anger and that hatred and all of my attachment to the bonding that I had done with these wounds and let go of that and cleared that out of my life, my writing began to take place at a much higher level. In fact, I wrote Erroneous Zones in a very, very short time after that. I began to get myself back in shape. I began to eat better. I began exercising, keeping my, uh, got my weight down. And the people that were supposed to come into my life, like my beautiful wife, who sits here with me this evening, and all of our children, some of whom are here this evening. <laughs> all of it was allowed to flow when I released that, that energy of negativity and blame and hatred. They say that you never die from a snake bite. It isn't the bite. And you can't be unbitten. It's in the wake. What kills you is the venom that continues to pour through you long after the bite has taken place. And that's something we have control over and we can change. And I'd like to suggest that what happens is that many of us bond ourselves to these wounds of our past. If I were to cut my hand, just cut it and watch it, my nature says, close up the wound. And I just have to watch it. And there's no doctor out there. There's no medicine out there that's going to heal that wound. There's something, there's a healing stream that I am connected to that will allow that wound to heal. So my nature says, close up the wounds. Don't bond to them. Don't hang on to them. Close them up. But supposing I say to myself, oh, no, you don't. There's no way I'm going to let you close up. <laughs> you see, if I can keep you open and I can go to you and say, look at this. Say, so what happened? Well, look at this cut I've got. Oh, you poor thing. Look at that. It seems to be getting worse. It's getting infected. Isn't that terrible? And if you practice this kind of a mentality, when your nature says close up the wound, but you keep it open, before long you lose your hand. And after that, you lose your arm. And the whole organism will be destroyed if you don't let your nature take over. And your nature also says close up the wounds of your past. Close them up. And oftentimes we ignore our nature. I had a great teacher that came into my life through his writing. His name was Nisargadatta Maharaj. 
lived in India up until the mid-1980s. And he wrote something called I Am That, which was very powerful and influential in my life. And one of the things that he talked about when he was asked the question, what's the difference between, say, a saint or a highly functioning human being, a spiritual master, a spiritual teacher, and the rest of us? Is that they have unconditional love in them? And you don't or we don't? And he said, no. He said, saints have unconditional love in them and so do you. He said, the difference between ordinary human awareness and higher awareness people is that they have nothing else inside of them. That's all they have. And it's almost like we have to learn how to get that in ourselves. To be able to, well, I always like to use the metaphor of an orange. I love the orange. Perhaps living in Florida is why, but an orange is a simple metaphor. You take this orange and you squeeze it as hard as you can squeeze it. And you ask yourself, what will come out? And what comes out when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. Never, no matter how many times you squeeze it, will apple juice come out. There's no mistakes. You'll never get grapefruit juice out of this thing, ever. The only thing you'll ever get out of it is orange juice. And the next question is why? Why when you squeeze an orange, as hard as you can squeeze it, does orange juice come out? And I asked that question up in Toronto one time, there's a little girl sitting right in the front row. She said, that's dumb. <laughs> it's a, it, she said, that's what's inside. It has to come out. I said, well, that's the answer. <laughs> you are really smart. And she smiled and she thought that was great. But that's the truth. The reason that orange juice comes out when you squeeze it is because that's what's inside. Now you extend the metaphor and someone squeezes you. That is, someone says something about you that you don't like. Someone behaves towards you in a way that you find offensive. Somebody does something or says something to you that you feel hurt by. And out of you comes anger, hatred, bitterness, tension, fear, anxiety, stress. And immediately you say, the reason that comes out of me is because of how he said it or the way that she said that or because they did that. But the truth is, the reality is, that what comes out is what's inside. And if you don't like what's inside, you can change it. Now, if you ask me, how does orange juice get inside of an orange? I would say, I don't know. I can't figure it out. That's a mystery to me. I just enjoy the oranges of my life and give God the credit for that. A lot of people think that other things make them the way they are. They will blame their past, they'll blame their parents, they'll blame the economy, they'll blame the Ayatollah, they'll blame somebody for things that are going wrong in their life. And one of the favorite things that we have to blame for why I'm upset at a particular moment is something called traffic. Traffic made me upset. And I've always reminded myself when I'm in a jam or when I'm on the freeway and I'm trying to get someplace, that traffic doesn't care that you have within you the opportunity in this moment to really work on these things that are perhaps debilitating or, or creating anxiety or stress in your life, that these are tests, these are opportunities for you. Traffic doesn't care. Your anger is your choice and you can always choose to be either be at happy, angry, depressed, miserable, upset, or you can choose to be fulfilled and do something positive in this moment. It's always up to you. I'd like to give you what I think of as the great spiritual teachings of many various persuasions. There's a story that summarizes it. It's the story of what I call the four philanthropists in a village. The conquerors had come through and they had taken all of the men or many of the men who were warriors at the time and they had placed them into this prisoner of war camp right in the village. And many of the villagers knew that their compatriots were imprisoned. And the first philanthropist was a person who had great wealth. And he went to the people who had the prison and were in charge of it. And he said to them, I understand the men are not able to have fresh water and cold water. I would like to donate all of my earnings and everything that I have to purifying the water for them and making sure that all of them will not be sick. And he was granted that. And he felt like he had fulfilled his destiny, that he had done what he was here for. 
The second philanthropist discovered that the men were sleeping on rocks and that they were cold at night. They didn't have blankets. And he took all of his funds and he said to them, I would like to provide bedding and blankets for the people so that they will be comfortable when they sleep at night. And he was granted that right. And he donated his money for this purpose. And again, he felt that he was fulfilling his destiny. The third philanthropist discovered that the food that they were eating was inadequate, that they were just given uh, beans and, and, uh, and water and some bread. And so he said, I own a farm and I'd like to grow all of my food and I'd like to take this food to all of these prisoners. And he was granted that right. And all three of these great philanthropists in the village felt that they had really completed their mission for why they were here. But the fourth philanthropist was a saint. He was living not at ordinary human awareness, but at higher consciousness levels. And he went and he found out where the keys were. And he went to the prison at night and he released all of the prisoners. And this little metaphorical story really tells us that when we are living at ordinary human awareness, there's nothing wrong with those who are out there who can help us to suffer in comfort, all right? <laughs> and many of us have learned to do that and accept that and say, all right, as long as I'm comfortable, even if I'm suffering, it's okay. But there are those who have keys, and those keys can open the prisons. One of the great teachers in my life was Carlos Castaneda. And Castaneda talked about his teacher, who was what they call a nagual, a, a Native American term that uh, refers to uh, all that is knowable. And he, his teacher told him that your life is like being born into a, uh, a room, a mansion, if you will, that has a thousand rooms, but you're born into one room. And this one room is called daily human awareness. And the only way you can get in is through conception and birth. You're in. And the only way you can get out, we are taught, is to die. So we spend our lives in this mansion in one room. Even though there's 999 other rooms, we don't know how to get out into those rooms unless we die. So we wait to die. And what his teacher told him is, I can teach you how to get out of the room of daily awareness and into the other 999 rooms. And if you stay with me and learn all that I have to give you, I can teach you how to get out of the house altogether without having to die. And what we have to do in order to get to that place where we can take the keys and unlock the self-imposed prisons or the prisons that we have given ourselves on the basis of what we have come to believe is our limitations, what we can and can't do. We have to let go of that. And I call it rewriting our agreement with reality. We literally have to make a, a, a whole new contract with what it is that I perceive to be what is possible for me. And in order to do that, we have to shift out of the things that we have come to believe in and everything that you came to this program watching tonight that you believe in was handed to you by someone else outside of you, was handed to you by the experiences or testimony of someone in the past. And because it comes from outside of you, there is still an element of doubt. And this element of doubt isn't bad, but it keeps you from reaching higher levels because what you think about is what expands. And if you're thinking doubt, then doubt is what expands. William Blake said, if the sun and moon should ever doubt, they would immediately go out. So how do we get past what we believe in or what has been handed to us and still honor it and be grateful for all of the teachers and all of the people who have come before us so what we have to learn to do is let go of that tribal consciousness and shift to what I call a knowing. Now there's a big difference between what you believe and what you know. Everything that you know is something that you have made conscious contact with. Conscious contact. 
So there's nobody out there watching, there's nobody in this world who knows how to swim, who learned it by somebody else telling them that you can swim, or by watching Mark Spitz go through the water, <laughs> or by uh, observing other people doing it. You may remove some of the doubt, but you will never know how to swim until you get in the water and blub around a few times and then do it. And then you'll have a knowing, and that knowing is something that you'll never lose, just like riding a bicycle or dancing the Macarena or making a, a, a lemon meringue pie or anything that you know how to do. It's because you've made conscious contact. And I'd like to suggest that there's a big difference between knowing about a divine presence, knowing about a sacred awareness, knowing about God, and knowing God. There's a big difference. Just like there's a big difference between knowing about the possibility of being able to heal myself of something that is bothering me, perhaps a disease process. I perhaps may believe that it's possible because I've read other people and I've heard others say it. And I've read the testimony and I've listened to the tapes and I've gone to the seminars. But until you have made conscious contact with it, you'll never know it. And I'd like to suggest there are, there's a wonderful poem. I'd like to share this poem with you. It's uh, written by a wonderful woman her name is Valerie Cox, and she lives up in Seattle, and she's written quite a bit of poetry. This particular poem really speaks to me to the difference between what you know and what you believe in. Immerse yourself in, this, in these words. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She munched cookies and watched the clock as this gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. And when only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. And with a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. I love that. I love that. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief, the cookie thief. And all of us in some ways are cookie thieves. 